Welcome to the Fuel Pulse Show podcast. I'm your host, Eric Bjornstad, your guide through the ever-changing world of fuel. The Fuel Pulse Show is for anyone who uses fuel or who has things that use fuel, whether at work or at home, which means it's pretty much for everyone. So today on the Fuel Pulse Show podcast, we are picking back up with the previous discussion that we were having with Brian Hartley, the owner of the fuel service company Diesel Dialysis. Now, in our previous episode, part one, Brian and I talked about how fuel maintenance has changed from how it was in the past. We talked about the real reasons that people get suspicious of the fuel polishing industry, and quite frankly, how those suspicions can sometimes be well-founded. We talked about how you solve sulfur problems in stored diesel fuel, what you can do, but also, very importantly, what you can't do. And we talked about why simply pouring biocides into an infected tank, whether it's a storage tank or a generator tank, why that isn't always the best way to get rid of microbial problems. And then we wrapped up part one by touching on the issue of testing and its important role in taking good care of fuel. So if you missed part one with Brian Hartley, I'd encourage you to go back and check it out because today we are going to pick back up on the discussion with part two. So we're going to talk about the importance of good fuel sampling and why test results are only as good as the sample that you have. We're going to pick back up on the biocide discussion and talk about why it is so hard to solve microbial problems in storage tanks and generator tanks. And while we're at it, we're going to slip in a discussion about the problem that really plagues the industry, and that is microbially induced corrosion. Uh, from a practical advice standpoint, we definitely are going to touch on some points on what celebrate or separates a good fuel servicer or fuel polisher from a bad one. Um, if you need to use one and you're trying to pick one, what are the right questions, the important questions for you to ask? And what is the most important thing for anyone to do to prevent fuel storage and tank problems? So I think you're really going to enjoy the second part of this discussion with Brian Hartley from Diesel Dialysis. So without any further ado, let's get to it. What a lot of people don't realize about sampling or the conceptual thing about sampling is that, a, you know, you, you take a sample out of a 10,000 gallon tank. So you've taken, uh, you know, 500 milliliters or ho however much your bacon bomb holds. Um, and then you're going to test that. You're going to run whatever ASTM test you have, and it's going to mm -hmm. give you results. And you're going to say that that is what is true of all the fuel in your tank. You're going to say it's representative of the entire field. But like right. you pointed out, there are there can be significant differences in certain fuel properties uh, or the condition of the fuel, depending on where in the tank you you, you sample. So if you're sampling for to try yeah. and figure out if you've got a microbial problem, for example, they always the the, the best practice is to sample uh, down near the bottom. Um especially if you've got a, a water phase, and then to sample maybe about 18 inches above mm -hmm. that. But you don't want to sample right mm -hmm. at the very top because there's going to be no microbes in there. Just like what you said, there's typically no water right. up there. So if you're trying to determine how much water's in your, your, your tank, um, if someone didn't know any better, just scoop, you know, took, took some fuel from the top and then ran a Carl Fisher on it and it came back, you know, well clean or what, what, however many PPMs in there, they say, oh, I don't have any water in my tank. That's because they didn't know that right. all that test really told you was how much water was in that fuel that came from that little location in what it could be a very big tank. Correct. Right, right. You know, and and then that's why we 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 push uh, mm -hmm. doing bottom sampling for the majority of everything that we do. It's not the only time. You, you know, we don't do that on everything. But if you can pull bottom samples and they are clean and clear, and yep. all those tests pass, well, you can you can reasonably say that the fuel above that yeah. is going to be yes. as good or better. Yeah, yeah. Right. So, um, you know, that's why it's, it's important to sample from the right places. Sampling from the top, you cannot say no. that all of your fuel is the same. 
sample from the bottom, you can get a pretty good representation of where. Yeah, I think that's lie. why in some of the ASTM sampling protocols that they have, which for if people out there don't really know, they uh, ASTM of course stands for what's American Society for Testing and Materials. They are the the mm -hmm. organization, a conglomerate of industry professionals, government, basically anybody who has a stake in a specific thing. But they write, uh, they do a. They, they write all of the the rules and recommendations for how to define any number of things. And so for fuel, they have subcommittees that deal with fuel. And so they have you know, sampling is such an important thing to get right that they have um, at least one ASTM protocol just on sampling, how to do it, how to handle your samples, um, yeah. how to store your samples, uh, because it all comes down to your test results are only as good as the sample that you have. And if you don't sample from the right place, right. like you were alluding to, and if you don't handle that sample correctly, uh, your your test results are gonna you know have very good possibility of getting skewed. Getting skewed. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely. So you know that uh, um, that leads us into starting to talk about mm -hmm. some some of the other things. You know, we we, we know that these sample. We know okay. So you know you have these problems. Um, uh, you know now we got to talk about yeah. What do you do about and getting them corrected? Uh, so uh, that's where uh, polishing and mm -hmm. pumping water off the bottom tanks and additives come in. They're, those are the those are tools that we use to uh, help remediate those problems. Um, the larger the tank, the harder that problem yes. can be to solve. Um, it's it's important to get a hold of these, uh, especially generators. Uh, base tanks are one of the hardest tanks out there to clean. Uh, they are covered in; they're full of mm -hmm. baffles. If you have water and bacteria growing in in between those compartments that are yep. sub subdivided into this big tank, uh, yeah. How do you get to those yeah, sections? Yeah, yeah. Well, it can be very, well, and, very, and very difficult. That that. Tells you first and foremost why it's important to engage somebody like you who knows who knows that this 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 com these complexities exist yeah. and are able to account for those. Um, and at the same time, right. you know it's important to know that those complexities exist because for certain types of problems like the water, like the, especially for the microbes, if you've got a bunch of baffles in your tank, microbes don't need very much of a hiding place to 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 uh, kind of stay dormant, stay hidden, and that's why it's really Correct. important if you're adding a biocide. Uh, if you got to the point where you you know you have a micro problem and you are following the best practice of adding a biocide, you have to get that fuel moving and get that biocide into as many of the places in that tank as possible. Uh, because if you miss, sure. if it misses a place. It does not take very many microbes to essentially re-inoculate the tank and the problem comes back again in, you know, a couple months or however long. Right. Yeah, and, you know, and the, the, other, the other problem that you have with that is, is not only is it affecting your fuel, um, it's affecting yeah. your tank. Uh, you know, uh, microbial and MIC? corrosion. Uh, I, it, there is, yeah, a good old mech, right? Um, the the number of tanks that we see that have failed. Yeah, tell us about that. Um, majority of those tanks tank failures is not from outside the tank. It's from inside, uh, and they are all, all, almost ninety nine percent of the time. Mm -hmm. Fuel quality uh, was a direct result on that tank failing and tank, that tank leaking um, because the microbes will actually. I mean, they, they're so yep. so corrosive. And they'll eat yes. right through the metal. So quarter inch plate steel, if you have a microbial problem in, their in that tank and you ignore it, um, within a, a year or two, you can have holes yeah, in the Yeah, I was going to ask, how, how often do you see, you know, MIC, my microbial induced corrosion? And what are the worst, if you can remember, what's what are some of the worst ones that you've seen? Um, so... I see on on every job that you have microbial growth. If it's if it's more than a mm -hmm. six month uh, issue, yeah, there there's corrosion in there. there. There's almost always. I just did a job last week where I had a customer who was they were moving a generator. They had a they yep. have a concrete pad 
and the the uh, the pad had to be uh, excavated for uh, for one issue. So they were basically picking the generator up and moving it. Well, you can't move a base tank no. with fuel in it. So they had me out there to pump the fuel out into mm -hmm. a temporary tank, and they moved the gen, and then I was putting the fuel back into the tank. Um, it had one of the old heating oil yeah. tank gauges on the front, and the tank was full of water. So I pumped the tank out, and uh, God, the amount of corrosion on the bottom of this tank, it's scary. Um, you know, it's borderline to do you, do you start yeah. looking for a new tank? How long yeah. is this tank going to last? Well, it's very, very difficult to know. You know, this is when you get into start look talking about ultrasonic mm -hmm. thickness testing and looking for thin yeah. spots and, and you know, certifying a tank. And sometimes that process can get more expensive than the tank. Unle itself. Unless you balance so, the potential um, liability of what, what happens if that tank fails. And you <laughs> Correct. Right, right. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, this. Uh, uh, so I see that a lot. And that's one of the other processes that we do is, yes, we do polishing. Yes, we do additives. And the other side of it is uh, trying to prevent that water and contamination mm -hmm. from getting in the tank. How do you do that? Well, most of these tanks that are built are shipped out. You know, it's just yeah. like anything else in the industry, right? Uh, they're, they're, they're putting the money into the tank and all of these extra items that go on top of the yep. tank, emergency vents, standard vents, your gauges, your, your fill caps, um, they're usually the least expensive item sure. they can possibly put on there. Uh, so those items typically are not going to help your fuel, right? So uh, you want to put cap, uh, you, you know, put sealed uh, caps on there. We want to put uh, filtration mm -hmm. units on your vents, um, on, on outside tanks and inside, depending on the style of tank, uh, we want to pay attention to those emergency vents. Are they uh -huh. plumbed incorrectly? Are they? Are we using vents that are uh, shedding water from them? Uh, a lot of a lot of tanks, day tanks, space tanks, um, they use spring-loaded vents with a uh, a rubber seal on the top and just a, a steel plate. If you can see your seal, uh, that that vent probably should be replaced because it's going to leak at some point. Uh, if you have water sitting on top of that, that seal is going to uh, leak. Eventually. How often, um, uh, when you talk about microbial induced corrosion, uh, how often do you see vapor space corrosion? Uh, that's quite a bit, you know, and that gets into, there's a lot of, uh, a mm -hmm. lot of rust in these tanks. Um, it's all moisture yep. related issues. So, you know, this is why we, we do heavily with um, mm -hmm. breather systems and putting desiccant yep. units on if we can. Um, you know, I, I like to use the old, the old, uh, saying of like this, right? So you go out and buy a brand new car, bring it home to your mm -hmm. house and park it in your driveway. Do you leave your windows down? <laughs> yeah. No, you're going to roll your windows up. Why? Because you don't want the outside elements into your car, right? So you go buy a brand new tank and you buy a brand new, all this brand new fuel and you stick it out into your, in, in the field and mm -hmm. you have an open vent pipe. Um, oh. What are we doing about that? Every time this tank expands and contracts with sunlight and heat, um, refilling, yep. using fuel, we're sucking moisture into there. We're putting dirt into that tank. And those are all things that are yes, going to will. affect your fuel. So let's get breather systems on there to, to help isolate that and filter that air and, and strip moisture from it. Um, and those will help with that oleage space, yep. keeping it dry. Yeah, I know that... Um, there are. I, I I know that the the EPA and some groups like uh, I think the Fuels Institute they they started looking at vapor the issue of vapor space corrosion. Um, I don't don't want to get my years wrong, but probably about maybe ten years ago. Um, and they're still they're they're still really trying to get a handle on how extensive the problem is and the causes of it. But mm -hmm. they've been able to find out. Uh, some 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 useful things for for the industry, and I I remember reading through some of the reports. I think we call it the Patel report. Um, but they talked about how uh, that for a long time in the industry they thought that vapor space corrosion was pretty well impossible, uh, and until people started seeing it, and they didn't realize that there were all these different kinds of microbes 
that were producing, you know, in the course of respiration and their, their life cycles, they were producing these really lightweight acids, these small molecular acids mm -hmm. that were small enough that they could volatilize and go up into the vapor space. And then they would condense there because there's always water around and they would start to corrode yeah. all of these, these things. And I think that, yeah, absolutely. You know, the, the, uh, I use the underground tanks as a, a pr prime example of that. You know, they, uh, um, if it's a hundred degree day and 90% mm -hmm. humidity and you're pulling fuel from a, uh, from a tank that's at a gas station, um you're pulling all that hot warm moist air into the tank well as soon as it gets down into that tank and hits that yep. 50 degree side right we get we mm -hmm. get condensation build up on the walls we get corrosion build up we get bacteria starts growing in there which yep. ends up in the fuel and creates yeah, absolutely. problems right yeah you know so it's one of one of the things i, I always hear it all the time with, with guys yeah. like the, the truck world well i know i have good fuel because i bought my fuel from a uh, high yes, volume yes. Uh, gas station. They yeah. turn over their fuel. No a lot. problems. Well, it's it's good because you haven't um, you you don't have to worry about those mm -hmm. stability problems, right? The, those that side of the, the the spectrum is really not a problem if fuel is being turned over every week, but you're bringing in all kinds of other problems with the moisture and and the dirt and and all those things that are being pulled into those tanks mm -hmm. on a daily basis. Uh, so. Yeah, that's a whole other side. So, when you uh, uh, get called out to a job, or you do a scheduled service on some tanks, what what typically happens when you get on site? How does that kind of visit go? Do you have certain things that you have a protocol of of doing in the course of of that kind of visit? So, right, really depends on the uh, the, the the type sure. of call and what we're going on, right? So, we we do provide maintenance programs and maintenance plans for uh, for customers. And those are based upon uh, us doing a remediation okay. in the beginning. And then we do an annual maintenance program where we provide them with uh, yep. additives, uh, the polishing, sampling, and breathers. And uh, again, we, we also upfit tanks and inspect all those tanks for leaks. Okay. Um, caulking up wires and sensors yeah. and things like that, making sure those are all good. And on, we do that on a regular basis, even just the paint on a tank. We, we need to make sure that we're not getting, you know, rust on mm -hmm. an outside of a tank and you know, all those types of things we look at. Uh, now on a site that we haven't been to or, or a brand new uh, site. Yeah. We're, we're, we're going to go out there and pull samples and then do an evaluation and do an inspection. Uh, um, and see where they're at and what they need. Well, and that um, sounds reasonable because majority of the time, you you can't you you, you get these uh, what 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 some of my colleagues call the ham and eggers who will go out there and they they won't do that. They'll just do a cursory examination yeah. and they'll say, oh well, your problem is definitely this, and therefore you need X, Y, and Z. But what you're talking about is the proper way right. to do this kind of thing. Listen, it gets very difficult because you, you have to drive out to all these sites yeah. and evaluate them. <laughs> and and you may not get any work out of it. So, uh, you know, you may, you may end up doing it for free. It, it happens. Um, but, uh, yeah, you know, if you have a if you have somebody who um, is going to provide you with a price to evaluate or, or price to remediate your tank uh, without having asked yeah. any questions, Without having asked mm -hmm. for pictures, without having asked for um, a, a history, uh, they're just throwing you a price. Uh, probably not. No, the correct no, place no. To go. And and um, you know, uh, we're, you, you touch on something that's really important because uh, you know people out there who may never have uh, had to solve this kind of problem before. They. They've never had to engage the services of a company like yours, of a fuel polisher or a, a fuel service professional. They don't know what to look for and what distinguishes a, a good company from a bad company. So what you said, I think, is really important that um, you have to have you, the if you're the customer, you have to choose a, a mm -hmm. company that you're confident uh, is going to, if they go out and they don't find a problem that, like you said, they may not get any business out of it. Um, so they have to be confident mm -hmm. that your, that, that company that they engage with is not going to just, 
tell them they need something just because they don't want to go out there. Right. You know, listen, I, I, I have, I have quoted tanks without seeing them in person. Uh, they're typically a lot of back and forth with, yes. uh, send me pictures. Uh, I want to, I want to see what's going on. I, I, you know, even, even though I may not have seen the fuel or pull a sample myself, depending on the size of it, um, uh, you know, a, a 300 gallon tank that I haven't seen, I, I can, I can, I've been in this field long enough that I can pretty well guess what's going on in there with mm -hmm. some pictures of the tank and, and know what's going on. Um, a 10,000 gallon Harder. tank. Yeah. I'm, I'm not doing yeah. that. I have. Yeah, I, I need to I need to go see it and pull samples for myself, and and that goes back to yeah. the whole boat boat world. Uh, guys with the boats, I'm very selective about boat work. Um, they are very 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 difficult. Most of them are built without act, means of access to a tank. Um, I, I get it all the time. Well, can't you just hook up to the supply and return lines on my from the generator from the engine? Uh, if that's your only access to the tank. I'm going to tell you to call somebody else. I'm not interested. I'm because I don't feel like I'm going to be able to give you the results that I would expect. Right. Doing that. Right. I know what I expect. If I'm not going to be able to do that, I'd rather. Well, you don't want your you don't want your name phone. attached to something that you're not confident that you can uh, provide value for for that that right. that customer. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, this goes back to that whole quality mm -hmm. over quantity thing. You know. Um, uh, there, there are a lot of companies out there and on a large scale that are doing this, and a lot of them mm -hmm. do good work as well. Uh, but you, you start to lose. Those are the companies that often will say, uh, sure, we can do that, no problem, having never looked at it, having never seen a picture, having never seen anything, and just throwing prices out. Um, yeah, for me, uh, I'm going to go look at all those tanks. I want to see yeah, what's going so on myself. One of the things, if, if someone's saying, how do I know a good company from a bad company? It's, it's pretty apparent that one of the big things is what kind of questions, well, do they ask questions, first of all, before telling you what you need? Right. And then what kind of questions? So the kind of questions that they should expect someone to to ask them, I mean, you've got uh, size of tank, right? What, what are... Sure, they want to know... Size of tank, access to the tank. Um, is there, uh, you know, electric and water nearby? Um, you know, uh, you can feel free to ask that company yeah. for references. They, uh, do you have other customers mm -hmm. that I can talk to? If they're not willing to give you other customers' names, tells you something um, about them. That's an indicator of, of right. You know, call me. I'll, I'll give you any one of my customers. I'll give you their names, and I'll even set you up an appointment to let you drive yeah. out and see, go visit yeah. them. Feel free. Uh, I'm confident that my yeah. work speaks for itself. All right. So, um, and, and you know, again, we're a small company. And I'm on almost every every single job site, <laughs> so I know what's going on. Uh, you know, sometimes that's a little difficult. We end up uh, pushing stuff out a, yeah. a little longer than we like, uh, but it happens. So you got to be you got to be confident that your your service provider is going to treat your equipment or your tank or your fuel as if it were their own um, yeah confidence is is you know? really important i think of the 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 customer has to have confidence that uh you you know the the, the vendor the service company uh, have their best interests uh, at heart, that they're not just out to get as much money from them as possible. And so I think, you know, the willingness right. to answer questions, to provide information, to tell them things, important things that they don't even know are important. That's that's a big thing. If you, you don't know what you don't know, mm -hmm. and if a company like yours is willing to to tell them things that uh, not only are objectively important, but are things they didn't know were things they need to look for. That's the, the, that to me is a really good indicator that that company, uh, if they do end up doing work for that customer, they're going to do it right. They're going to care about the quality of it. They're going right. to care that the problem's solved because there's so many companies out there, just like there's so many, you know, fuel additive makers that are you know they, they make shady stuff right there's so many people out there in your sector that really don't do that good of a job there's good ones but there's a lot of bad ones you know there's a lot of bad ones right you just you just gotta um you know it's it's, it's no different than hiring oh, a contractor yeah. who's working on your house um 
check them out, man. Make sure they have, make sure they're uh-huh. insured for what they're doing. Make sure that they, they, they have the equipment, ask them to see their equipment, ask them what yeah. kind of equipment they're using. Um, you know, feel free to ask them if the, they can send you some documentation on the additives that they're putting yeah. into your, your tanks. Uh, if they're not willing to do that, that's an indicator. You, well, and you that shows with the additives, that shows that they understand enough about the big picture and how the additives fit into that picture that they're more likely to recommend the right ones and use them in the correct way. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. Listen, we, we learn we learn stuff new all oh, the yeah. time, man. I I uh, actually was uh, just in touch with your guys about I have a I have a a problem uh, on a site where I have a foot valve that mm-hmm. was hanging up, and uh, it was it was it's getting some varnish buildup on it, and this is a tank that has been treated in the past, and I'm still getting other issues. So um, you know, reaching out to having a, a partner like Bell. Where I can talk to and say, "Hey guys, what what's mm-hmm. going on? What can we do to help this?" and and recommend some other uh, additional measures and steps to prevent that from happening again is, is huge. You know, it's it's great. I I I need that as part of my yeah. business, and so do my customers. So we rely on those relationships to to ultimately help help them in the end. All right. Well. Um... Last couple of questions here, because uh, we've certainly run through a lot of good stuff here. Um, so uh, to to tie a lot of this together, um, you know, speaking from the, the viewpoint of those professionals out there who, you know, they're, they're the ones that they have jobs that require them to use fuel. So they have to take care of it to a certain extent. Mm-hmm. Um, and they so they have fuel storage tanks. Uh are there any, what would be the most important uh, best practice recommendations that you could give them to make sure that they're doing to prevent problems uh, from arising? Um, I would say that if you had to do only one thing, um, it would be to sample that fuel okay. on a regular basis. And how basis. often, How wh- what there. would be the best sweet spot as far as how often they should do that? So it depends on the, depends on the site and depends on the, um, you know, the, um, um, how important the fuel is, if it's a life safety, yep. that type of stuff. Uh, at least mm-hmm. once a year, ideally okay. twice a year. Right. So uh, again, we, we can, we can adjust that based upon the customer. But um, at minimum once a year, uh, I like to say twice if you can. If you can do okay. twice, that's that's better. Um, sampling, uh, using good additives. Um, we talked about rolling up the window, yeah. uh, getting that fuel isolated from yep. the outside environment. Get filter systems on there. Prevent water from getting into the tank. Um, Check for water. It's amazing what a little bit of caulking can do. Check yeah. for water, right? <laughs> Yeah, these these things that that's all part of the sampling side. You got to got to do that. If you're if you're if you're doing those things, um, the chances of you catching on to a problem before it's a problem are greatly increased, and they will ultimately save your fuel, uh, save, your tank. save you money. Um, yeah. Yep, save your tank. You know that's the other thing. What's the I, I get this a lot. What's the life expectancy Depends. of a tank? No manufacturer puts a yeah. number on a tank. Uh, tanks can li- can last forever if they're uh-huh. maintained properly, and they do not. If you maintain your fuel, that's that's how you maintain the inside of your tank. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, that's you know? well, one of the things I do a lot here at Bell in, in in my role. Since since I'm the technical director, I answer lots of questions, and I have to explain to people. Uh, you know, whether it's customers or salespeople, whoever, I have to explain how things work. And almost literally the most common answer that I have to give to when somebody says a question like, how long will this last? Or what, you know, what, what can I expect? The most common answer I have to give it is it depends because there's so many things uh, that can go into whether you're talking about the life of a tank, whether you're talking about if you add a fuel stabilizer, how long is it going to extend my, my life? Well, it depends. Um, you know, what, what, one thing that you right. talked about, uh, uh, you know, maybe 20, 25 minutes ago, when you talked about the fact that uh, while all diesel fuels, well, and gasoline too, but we'll stick to diesel they, they have certain specifications mm-hmm. that they're required to meet, but that doesn't mean that they're all the same. And when you talk about you right. can test yourself 
uh, and to, you know, you can spend as much money as you want test doing testing to find problems out. The one thing that came to, to my mind was uh, something like cold flow, for example. So up in New Jersey, you know, we're, we're down in Florida. We don't get a whole lot of cold flow uh, problems down here, uh, although we do formulate uh, cold flow, cold flow packages. Yeah, right. And right. what I think what a lot of people don't realize about fuels and about cold flow, when they say, when they say, if I add this anti-gel, uh, what's going to be, you know, what temperature will it, will it protect me to? And of course the answer to that really is it depends. And one of the things that it depends, depends. on yeah. is the, the molecular composition of that fuel, because as we know, all diesel right. fuel has paraffins in it. That's why it gels, but there's different sizes mm -hmm. of paraffins. And so if you really, if you were a really large fuel distributor, or, you know, you, you had to handle hundreds of thousands or millions of gallons of fuel, and it, you really had to get the right answer on what temperature drop could you expect if, with whatever treat rate of of anti Joe you were using, what you would do, you take a sample of that fuel and you'd have a, a, a paraffin breakdown done. And you could see the distribution mm -hmm. of the, the paraffins. And that would actually tell you, give you insight on how much drop in plug point or, or cloud point or, or pour point you could get. But most people aren't going to do that. And so there's... Right. Those, those, are, those are all things that we look at uh, when we when we mm -hmm. sample tanks. You know, we, we're, we're, we're in New Jersey. We're kind of in a borderline yeah. area, right? Um, it goes, goes back to that. It depends. Well, it really depends on uh, what readings we're getting mm -hmm. out of those out of that fuel. Um, our, our winters here, we can get cold yeah. snaps, uh, but we are typically not getting uh, no. minus 10, minus 20 degrees. Uh, our winters, uh, you know. We get an occasional uh, snaps of down into single digits, but they generally don't last really that long. Um, if you have fuel underground and it's put, piped into a building and the generators are inside, uh, you know, that yeah. the, 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 fuel is probably not going to be affected by it. But you have, and also the volume of fuel has a lot to do with it. You know, if you have an above mm -hmm. ground tank that's 5,000 gallons and it's a, let's say it's a, uh, a UL2085 mm -hmm. tank that's insulated, Right. So that fuel is probably not going to be affected by a cold snap. Uh, if you have a hundred gallon single wall tank sitting outside and you have a cold snap down uh -huh. to zero, it's yeah. going to be affected. Yeah, but, right. So you got, but, take, but you know, that person yeah. who has that hundred gallon, uh, yeah, it may be important for them that their fuel doesn't gel because depending on how they're using it. Um, right. But they're not going to spend five hundred dollars or a thousand dollars to get some some fancy test done to try and pinpoint that exactly. What what they're probably going to do is they're probably going to add uh, anti gel and maybe they'll double treat it um, yep. because it's that's the co most cost effective thing for them to do. Right. Yeah. It's it's uh, it's for something like that. Absolutely. Uh, it's it's literally pennies uh -huh. on the dollar to treat those tanks for those yeah. for those things you know it, it's very 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 minimal so yeah. um why not yeah. right? all right well brian uh where can if someone wants to contact you uh find out uh, more about what you can do for them uh wh where can people find you Sure. Uh, they can they can check us out on our, our website, uh, www.dieseldialysis or diesel-dialysis.com, uh, or you can give us a call, 856-470-7705. All right, great. Well, Brian, it's been a real pleasure uh, having you on today. Uh, thank you so much for joining us, sharing your expertise and your perspective uh, with us and our audience. You know, we really appreciate it. I appreciate it. Yeah, look. It was a lot of fun. This is, uh, you know, see how we can we can sit here. For, we can sit here for hours talking about this. Stuff. Well, well, you know, day. we uh, <laughs> I love talking uh, about, uh, you know, talk about boats. Right. Maybe, maybe at at some point in the future, we can have you on to talk about some, how some of these issues are affecting the marine market because that's certainly, you know, there's people out there and people who have boats, they they want to make sure that oh, yeah. yeah. So um, yeah, so thanks very much for joining yep, us. Absolutely. And so thanks. 
So that about wraps things up for today's episode of the Fuel Pulse Show. Thank you so much for spending part of your day with us. Check out our show notes at our website, www.bellperformance.com, for links to all of the things that we talked about today, including a link to Brian's company, Diesel Dialysis. Uh, please make sure to subscribe to this podcast at iTunes or Stitcher or wherever you get your podcasts. And also importantly, uh, if you would leave a rating for us, that will help people find us. So again, thank you very much for joining us. We'll see you next time on the next episode of the Fuel Pulse Show podcast. 